Good morning, I'm Amanda Kane. Um, I'll just uh, allow us to do a quick introduction so you know who's who because we have a mix of government, private sector, so I think it's a nice idea just to get an understanding of you know, what we're representing. Um, just to give you a little bit about my background, I'm a, I have a mix of finance and media background. I've been a journalist for BBC, RT, Russia Today. I was two years in Moscow. Um, and uh, also a finance background, so I'm currently with Pictet. Um, so Zena, unfortunately, cannot join us today because she does have a sore throat um, and is losing her voice. So please do approach her. She's sitting at the back of the room. Maybe give us a wave, Zena. <laughs> we can chat to you one-to-one -one after. Um, so let me uh, introduce the panel. I'll, I'll just go along the line. Well, a very warm uh, good morning to you all uh, here in uh, sunny Alpine Davos. My name is Vincent Subilia. I'm the uh, Director General of the Geneva Chamber of Commerce. I'm also a member of the um, Geneva Parliament, so I guess I'll be speaking with a double hat, uh, enforcing that uh, PPP that we uh, shall be discussing uh, on this uh, panel. Good to be here. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here is Irakli Mezurnishvili. I'm the Member of Parliament of Georgia. I'm the first deputy chairperson of the Sector Economy and Economic Policy Committee. It is great pleasure to be here and to discuss a very important issue. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Alexander Krivoshev. I work for Japan Tobacco. And why we're here today? We're here today for two reasons. One is that the Caspian area is very important for the, for the company. Uh, the countries which are around the Caspian Sea are the, the core of the activities uh, of the company Eastern Europe region. And the second point is uh, uh, we are quite interested by the issue of better regulation and proper regulation. With 45,000 employees and 120 countries where we operate, the issue of regulatory clarity is absolutely paramount for us. That's why we're here today and that's why I'm going to talk to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Filippo Lombardi. I've been an uh, entrepreneur myself, creating a multimedia group with radio, television, web, working with newspapers. That was my first job. Then I entered politics. I was 20 years member of the Swiss Senate. I've been president of the Senate, president of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Now I'm still having a function as a vice president of the Silk Road Support Group of the OSCE. And uh, on the other hand, I'm uh, back to business, being president of uh, Communication Switzerland, which is the umbrella organization of all communication, being media and commercial communication. Very good. Thank you very much. So our topic today is regulation. I'm going to ignore innovation uh, to the extent that we had a pre-discussion, and innovation by default is part of advancing regulation and what uh, governments and the, the private sector do, but of course it will be part of our discussion. Um, but regulation as a topic, the, it's quite interesting that uh, three out of the four have told me that regulation is a very, very effective, positive thing. Uh, the gentleman on the end, Filippo, has mentioned there is a mismatch in society in terms of attitude over regulation. So I think we'll start with that statement to open our discussion. Filippo. Thank you. There is, first of all, a contradiction between regulation and innovation. Because innovation in every field is trying to bring something new. And regulation is trying to consolidate something existing. So this is a philosophical clash you always have. No? Uh, on the one hand, you want to regulate. Uh, eh? On the other hand, those who are inventing, being in science, in, uh, in artist uh, fields, in uh, economic, in other business, uh, they, they want liberty, freedom to, uh, for entrepreneurship. Less regulation is better in a liberal view more regulation is better in a socialist view, if you want to say. Okay, we have to control the society. Sometimes, when you think about uh, health regulation or a number of things which happen in our societies, you hear in the, in the back a uh, little voice saying, we want to make people happy whether they like it or not. We will make them happy. We know how to regulate their life so that they are really happy. So this is a bit the contradiction we are, uh, we are living in. 
Uh, I think you know something about this in tobacco uh, branch, but there are other branches where, where good, in German we say, uh, good gemeint is das Gegenteil von gut. So if we think something good is the opposite of being good. You try to achieve something because you think you have to influence this society. It's not possible to accept that society develops so wild, and uh, and, and and you have to regulate this. Okay, it's now it is a bit um, a bit caricatural, but uh, in fact it is so. Uh, there is a tendency, and having been a politician myself, if I look 20 years long, of course we have been regulating a number of things. So the first thing, the first contradiction comes in the economy, in the business community itself. Why? Because as long as things are going well, the entrepreneur will say, we don't need regulation. When they are under threat from something, then, oh, please, state, help me, protect me a little bit from something and something else. This is the first contradiction in the business community itself. And then you have the state. Well, the state is politicians, government, parliamentarians, and, uh, and administration, civil servants. Well, politicians are for a short term there, usually. Administration is there for a long term. But both of them have finally the same uh, idea. We have to achieve something. If I've been x years in parliament, and they ask me, what have you done in these years? Um, I have to find out some regulation I had been, have been introducing, because this is what you can do when you uh, decide about new laws or you change the laws. Oh, I was able to regulate these. So at the end of the year, every politician is willing to say, oh, okay, I've been contributing to some new laws, not to taking away some laws. Yeah. That's a contradiction of the politicians and the administration also. And maybe I can come back to you a little bit later on this, the regulation and the advancements and the achievements, what's worked and what hasn't. Uh, before we go there, uh, Sasha and Arakli, I was discussing with you a bit earlier that regulation and the layering and advancement of regulation um, is by way of innovation for you. Maybe one of you would like to comment on uh, Filippo's point that uh, they're contradictory, whereas I think you found in your experience within Georgia that actually you've managed to integrate innovation in regulation. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. It's a great pleasure once again to be here. I think that uh, the issue we are discussing is uh, extremely important, important especially for the emerging markets, because I think, and I, this is my opinion, that regulation is not bad. Regulation must only be responsive, not only be responsive to a changing environment around us, but also proactively shape this environment. Without having a proper system in place uh, to update all the regulations and to pre predict some challenges in the future, I think the government could not be able to keep pace with the rapid change. And we have the real examples, I can give you the real examples of the positive impact of better regulations. For example, with the implementation of blockchain system in the private sector, the government of Georgia become the first country in the world with such a revolutionary change and it is very important and it makes uh, sense that better regulation is mm, extremely important for emerging countries. Iraqi, could you just explain yes. uh, the blockchain within how you're using blockchain in Georgia? Um, you know, uh, blockchain is an innovation and a new system and now we are uh, secure that all documents are becoming in the public sector is really under secure and uh, this is a really revolutionary thing and uh, several years ago it was absolutely unbelievable behind them believe that such a revolutionary a step could make Georgia but now this is a reality and this is one of the part of innovations and also uh, there are fundamental uh, issue of democracy that uh, individual freedom should be taken into account, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, we should forget of consumer rights, because also we have one negative example in Georgia. Uh, a decade ago, uh, 
previous government of Georgia decided to give the opportunity to the citizens to take loans without any regulations uh, only due to the ID and um, they could take any loans from the banks from the uh, microfinance organizations and after the years we have absolutely collapsed the system because we become we we had uh, 600,000 of people in the blacklist in the blacklist and can you imagine uh, we have to we should take in account that the whole population of Georgia is 3.7 million and 600,000 people were out of the economic life they c could not able to take uh, new loans and they were in the blacklist and if not the ex prime minister Bidzina Ivanishvili and the fund named Carto who solved this huge problem of Georgia uh, these people would stay in the blacklist and it means that they couldn't be able to receive their salaries even the salaries officially on the, their bank accounts and they was asking for the black market to take some loans so I think that if RIA, I mean the regulation impact assessment, could be decade ago, and we, if we could analyze the possibilities of the possible, predict the possible negative impact, so we didn't get this problem. So this is a real example. You mentioned that regulation uh, for emerging uh, economies especially is very important. Of course, uh, for different industries, regulation brings different things. Um, we spoke about trust as well. So on the one hand, it's about you know, bringing society back into the financial system. But is it also about increasing trust by in, you know, adding more regulation and better regulation? Most important thing is that uh, we should share the information. I mean, all players must unite and to have uh, the real one system. I mean, the government business and customers consumers because this is very important if government are going to change some regulations uh, we have to have dialogue the direct dialogue with the business and to give some kind of sometimes some transition period because this is extremely important we are all together creating the economic development of our country and it's not the only Georgia it's in other countries so I think that the most important is to have a dialogue and to share the information in this sphere and Sasha you come from uh, an entirely different industry how do you view regulation from your point of view in essence we are not f for more or less regulation we are for the quality of regulation and the quality is defined in few parameters uh, obviously, we can follow the principles which are defined by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, but most importantly for us to accentuate uh, two things. is clarity of rules, so you know how they applied equally across all the players uh, in the game. And secondly is engagement uh, of, the, of those parties that will be affected by the regulation uh, and those who have interest in this regulation in the dialogue in developing this. So there's particular echoes what Rakti has just said, but also it's particularly important for the new types of regulation that may appear. For example, you regulate Uber, you may need to ask taxi drivers, you may need to ask the operators, you may need to ask passengers' opinions. In our case, in the case of the tobacco industry, for example, you're talking about the new product which is now uh, coming up into the market, the vape product, you may need to ask consumers, you may need to ask health community, and you may need to ask manufacturers what it means. So that's engagement. Clarity of rules, applied equally across all the parties and engagement of all, uh, uh, of all the affected parties into, into the conversation. So if you look at the, at the, at the process of regulation, how this is applied, it's, it should be applied at every stage, where you monitor the regulation, when you, when you develop the proposals, when you actually implement the proposals, and when you have the, the follow-up. And that is the most rare thing, how you follow up the, the working of the regulation. The sunsetting clause is probably the weakest part of uh, the most advanced economies. How you end the regulation which is working and not working. There's a handful of countries like Mexico, New Zealand, New Zealand Australia, which actually implement properly the sunsetting clause. 
of the regulation in this case. But in our case, for example, I can give you uh, the, the vicious circle uh, of, of, of regulation when the poor analysis led to more regulation and the fiasco in the market. An example uh, could be coming from Russia when the government was increasing taxes 20% on the cigarettes, 20% year on year for a number of years. Uh, in, the, in the view that this will control the market. What it led to is the emergence of illicit market, which w within three years grew from zero to 15%. And in the size of Russia, 15% of the market is a good European country. So government is not getting to the uh, degree of $1.5 billion annually, and contraband makes it, makes, criminalizes the country. So what is the solution now? Is to create more regulation, because now we need to look also at the environment within the Eurasian Economic Union, and that needs to be regulated in the sense how you prevent illicit trade traveling in from, say, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, or Kazakhstan to the territory of Russia. So that's the vicious circle where the analysis was wrong because the industry was not fully engaged in the debate, not only industry, but also other affected parties. And then the solution, unfortunately, is more regulation again, instead of measures that could have been done uh, on time and properly. Good point you make in terms of standardizing um, regulation across countries, across the globe. It varies, of course it does. Uh, Vincent, maybe you can share with us some of your experiences, because I know that you represent somehow both the government and the private sector. Well, it was a great pleasure again, uh, it's really honored to be, uh, to be here. And if I may step back a little bit and so pay tribute to um, Caspian Week, and I've seen its chairman here say a big uh, thank you for having us uh, all here during the week, uh, precisely. Thank you, Murat. Um, again, the, um, the Geneva Chamber of Commerce has been uh, advocating the voice of the Geneva business community for over 155 years now, to the benefit of our 2,500 uh, corporate members, and I see a few uh, uh, across the board here, so um, good to have you uh, in, in, in the room. And regulation has always been at the DNA of what we uh, achieve, and it should obey. This has been uh, stated to the three S rule, as I call it, whereby regulation, when adopted, enacted, and then uh, implemented, should be uh, both sound, smart, and sharp. And what we uh, witness in today's disruptive environment is that there is a clear divide uh, between the political uh, uh, rhythm and uh, the, 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 the market uh, momentum. And I believe that uh, what we should humbly try and uh, achieve, and this is uh, uh, what Switzerland uh, is uh, uh, pursuing, is um, to reconcile and align uh, both that political uh, uh, momentum with the, uh, uh, with the business um, requirement. And this is where, you know the famous say, um, alone you'd go uh, uh, fast, together uh, you'd go far. I'm, I'm, I'm a fierce believer in the necessities, and this was alluded to by uh, um, uh, my, the, 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 the previous speakers, to the necessity to join forces uh, in order um, to combine uh, both the necessity uh, to regulate uh, from an incentive perspective, but also the stick uh, needs to be uh, uh, obeyed, uh, together with the carrot, as we say. Um, so to move forward uh, hand uh, in hand. You know, Switzerland uh, is often ranked as number one in terms of innovation, and this is something we shall be discussing, and competition. When it comes to uh, regulation, uh, I think there's margin of uh, maneuver. Uh, some of you in the room may be aware with what we call the Swiss finish, which is a tendency that we have in our country, and this is possibly what makes the magics of it, to go, um, um, to go, beyond uh, what is uh, possibly uh, needed and you know a bit like the uh, the fine tuning in the watchmaking industry where you want to make absolutely sure uh, and I could measure it this morning coming two hours away taking a bus and then a train that everything was running very smoothly so this is where regulation plays a key role but on the other hand you want to make sure that regulation leaves some space uh, uh, for innovation and, of course, uh, for, the, for the force of the, the business. And this is where, by conciling, by having that dialogue and coming back to what you just mentioned, ensuring that you have a multi-stakeholder approach and that a consensus-driven uh, method be implemented uh, to ensure that uh, regulation does not hamper uh, our business activities, but that it frames it 
in a balanced uh, way. So this is what the, the chamber being the nexus, if you wish, uh, as a private institution between the corporate world uh, and uh, the political uh, space, this is what we uh, uh, try to achieve on a daily basis. Let me, if I may, uh, quote two uh, recent examples of what uh, uh, has been uh, achieved precisely uh, here in uh, Switzerland. As you're all aware, um, Switzerland has adopted a major tax reform which allows our country, I believe, from January 1st this year to be uh, even more attractive to uh, uh, FDI. And this was the result of a 10-year uh, dialogue, precisely, and Mr. Lombardi uh, has been uh, actively involved in this, the Chamber in Geneva uh, also, whereby in uh, a system such as Switzerland, which is a, a democracy and the people uh, have the last word, we needed to convince. We needed to convince, which means that we need to do business literacy. Pedagogy is at the center stage of what we achieve in Switzerland. We need to ensure that the dialogue does not remain between corporate stakeholders, but that the dialogue be spread. And this is also one of the benefits and the leverage uh, of uh, the uh, World Economic Forum that gathers us here. So we managed to achieve it. It took time, but eventually, now we deliver predictability. Because for you all, business people, here in the room. What you want to know is have, if not a long-term, at least a medium-term uh, investment horizon. And this is what Switzerland, with a very uh, attractive tax environment, can offer to you now. Second example, and then I'll be done, from an innovation perspective. You know, Switzerland uh, is a renowned financial uh, center, and Geneva viewed as the best place of private banking and also trade finance. Now, we've, there's been a massive change of paradigm, as, a, as you all appreciate. And to position ourselves, we needed to make sure that the regulator would not always come with the stick, but would also come uh, with the carrot. And therefore, Switzerland has implemented what we call license light, positioning ourselves uh, as a key actor in fintech and allowing all actors to, again, free that energy that we have on the market while allowing that we can respect and protect the consumers. So this is that balance that we need to achieve. Not an easy task, but this is what the Chamber uh, is striving on a daily basis together with other partners. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Something um, <coughs> we discuss a lot in the, the financial sector is um, regulation regulatory risk is more important to us than reputational risk. Um, and you mentioned um, sort of the idea of, you know, regulation, if you're not careful, can stunt innovation and advancement. I don't know, Vincent, if maybe you can give us a couple of examples or an example whereby you've perhaps seen regulation going too far, that it stunts growth and opportunity, and, and perhaps this has, there has to be a way of backtracking a little well, indeed, there are uh, numerous examples whereby, um, as Mr. Lombardi mentioned, uh, we need to ensure that regulation uh, does not um, uh, hamper uh, the, 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 the business, uh, um, the business uh, reason. And there's ne there needs to be a very close monitoring and a follow-up of how regulation is being implemented. Because if we are in a prevention mood, uh, then again, uh, times uh, evolve, and therefore you need to ensure through some techniques. And being a qualified lawyer myself, I appreciate this. Uh, very, very sharply, the fact that, for instance, sunset closes, and you mentioned this, uh, uh, Sasha, uh, needs to be uh, properly implemented to make sure that, again, you can keep that alignment uh, between uh, regulation, uh, which is not a bad thing. I'm a, I'm a liberal myself as a member of the, the Geneva uh, Parliament, but humanitarian, uh, uh, one which I believe that regulation is key, because at the end of the day, these are the rules of the games that allow us to work as a community. But at the end of the day, you also want to make sure that uh, they do not backfire and have that adverse uh, effect. Uh, and this has, been, uh, uh, this has been witnessed, but I guess in Switzerland we have that level of pragmatism whereby with a consensus forward-driven process and a very clear methodology whereby all stakeholders are being convened from day one to hear their voice prior to taking the regulatory or legislative decision, we avoid these types of measures. You know, the, United, the, the European Union, which is our uh, uh, dearest and closest uh, uh, partner with uh, uh, trade flows of over a billion uh, on a daily uh, basis, is, is sometimes uh, viewed as having gone the extra mile in terms of regulation. And they, they, it's always claimed that the curve of the cucumber was decided uh, up in, in, in Brussels. So if you want to give uh, uh, examples, uh, I think uh, there this 
is uh, where possibly uh, we've, uh, we've gone too fast. And there is a natural tendency in that respect. Why? Because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we want to we know where we put our feet. And therefore, it is much more comfortable to have that strict line. But this can be, again, uh, a trade-off uh, in terms of uh, innovation because that spirit of creativity, which has been at the very heart of the DNA of Switzerland, needs to be uh, encouraged. So again, a very subtle uh, balance to be uh, uh, found and crafted through that uh, common dialogue that we're having today. Uh, in Switzerland, I know that we give the opportunity for self-regulation to some organisations. And Felipe, maybe you can explain um, what's working, what's worked in terms of self-regulation and where perhaps the lessons are. Yes, we've heard that uh, there are also positive aspects in the regulation, not only negatives. I wanted to point out a bit more. Of course, the, the real world is balanced always. That's true. We have to have a balanced regulation. And uh, we have to know that uh, the, the point of departure is not the same in every country. We have countries which are already really uh, highly regulated and others maybe coming out of a revolution of changes, of change of uh, uh, social and political system, who need still to regulate a number of things. So the, the point of departure is not the same for, for every country and for, every, for everybody. But uh, let's say if I try to to, to distinguish between the positive and the negative uh, impact of regulation. Positive impact is, of course, when rule of law is established, is uh, sure, is not established under the pressure of the one or the other actor, but trying to take care of the whole uh, economy on different, uh, the different present interests is predictable predictable because there is nothing worse than unpredictable regulation suddenly you this is by the way a danger in switzerland of course we we managed to keep the danger very low but you know the system of popular initiatives in switzerland you raise 100,000 signatures and you ask to change an article of the constitution we have the most uh, um, uh, un unstable regime all over the world. We change president every year, we change president of the parliament every year, uh, and we change constitution every year. Well, one article or two, so it's not so dramatic. But the constitution is the way where you can put new inputs. And of course, there are some risks. For instance, a couple of years ago, we rejected uh, uh, clearly, a popular initiative which was asking to change a system on the, uh, oh, how would you say it? Um, uh, succession, succession, uh, say it? Huh? Inheritance, inheritance taxation. Um, a very uh, big intro introduction of very important uh, inheritance taxation with retroactivity. So the day people voted, the effect would have been. Uh, at least two years uh, retroactive uh, for, uh, of course, it was rejected. Uh, Swiss people are quite reasonable, often, not always, and, uh, and they rejected it. But uh, after this, this discussion, we tried in Parliament to introduce a rule to say that these initiatives could not be accepted, not even submitted to a vote, if they are retroactive. And we were not able to bring it through the Parliament, because we should change the Constitution to create these new principles that new initiatives cannot be retroactive. So finally, we didn't manage anything, and we hope Swiss people will be reasonable enough also in the future to reject similar uh, proposals. So predictability and security are fundamental for a good rule of uh, law providing the uh, same uh, uh, equal uh, level uh, playing field for everybody. And the negative, the negative uh, effect of regulation, which is over-regulating, going too much in the details, leading to protectionism, because sometimes you protect some industries, some players, or your country, with regulatory uh, norms, which is not corresponding to the spirit of a positive uh, regulation, or you are uh, distorting, uh, diverting, uh, uh, um, competitiveness uh, um, probably uh, um, to the last uh, uh, of the country. So, finally, good regulation, uh, in my opinion, shall be the consequence of a deep and honest analysis of the context, the national and the international context where this regulation has to be implemented, should happen after an open debate with all interested circles. Uh, 
and we make it in Switzerland with this well-known uh, uh, consultation procedure. The government, before coming with a new proposal, has to make a consultation in all interested uh, uh, com business community, trade unions, party, uh, political parties, and so on. And on the basis of this consultation, it makes a report and say, we find the middle way or we w go to the one or the other extreme, but we have to motivate this. And Parliament, when discussing the law, will have hearings of the interested sectors and will have knowledge of what the report of the government on this consultation uh, has been. So it takes a bit longer maybe than in other countries, but the result is that it is what, what comes out is generally quite balanced and, and, and acceptable. And the last system, uh, and of course, in these, in these procedures, you always have lobbying taking place in Switzerland, like in other countries. What we try to do is that lobbying is always transparent. It must be transparent. And you must know, you want to regulate something, and not all the branch has the same interest. The big companies may have some interest, and the smaller uh, business, uh, other interest. Or the export-oriented companies have a kind of interest, which may be the locally uh, active companies uh, have a, a difference. So you must take uh, this balance. And finally, coming to, to the point you raised, of course, we try, we try and we don't always manage, to, um, to support self-regulation. Self-regulation being in a branch, the way of preventing, I mean, regulating yourself something before someone else is regulating it for you. So if the branch is, is keen enough, is uh, smart enough to understand that so self-regulation can prevent intervention of state, then let's do it. I take one example I've been working on. A couple of years, you know, small credit. Huh? Uh, people can, uh, in particular, not very rich people uh, uh, get a lot of debts because the, of this small credit to buy anything. Uh, and then they have very high interest rate and they, and they have a problem. So there was a parliamentary initiative from a socialist uh, colleague who said we have to forbid every um, uh, advertisement for small credits. And this was too much, of course. You pro if you forbid every advertisement for small credit, you should also uh, prohibit, for instance, uh, uh, car leasing advertisement, because the leasing is a small credit, and so on, a lot of things. So what we did with our organization, uh, Communication Switzerland, uh, we, we, we made consultations ourselves in the branch, in the banking branch, and in the small credit uh, activ uh, activities. And we came to the parliament with proposal of a self-regulation. This was accepted, mentioned in the law, the branch has to regulate this, so something are forbidden and something not, according to the code of conduct, and the state will intervene only if this code of conduct is not respected. Irakli, um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, maybe you can just draw some comparisons. A couple of key points were raised. I think the speed of regulation in Switzerland, it takes time. Um, in Georgia, perhaps you need to move quicker, so you ca can't afford that time sometimes. And maybe you can just draw some parallels and also um, if self-regulation and, you know, how you come to conclusions for policies and regulation, you know, how that, how that works for you and, and if you can sort of take something away from Switzerland with you. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, as a member of parliament, I can say that uh, we are actively in communication with the Minister of Justice with the Minister of Economy. Um, actually, we are Georgia is making the first steps uh, to adopt the uh, RIA uh, regulation impact assessment, uh, and I think this is a very important process. And when I was talking, of course, I agree with Mr. Filippo that uh, there are huge differences we, uh, between the developed countries and emerging markets and that's why the emerging this is extremely important especially for the emerging markets to have the right uh, regulations uh, because when i was talking about the example of um, collapse of the banking regulation system in georgia there was a result of these 600,000 people in blacklist uh, there was um, no regulations and um, uh, some of the contracts I saw by myself, there was uh, the annual 1,200% interest rate 
annual of loans. And people were signing these contracts because of lack of financial education. That's why we need to regulate also the banking system, the financial system, and we have to protect our citizens. All regulations, in my opinion, must have the one goal to have, to share and have the interests of our people, of our society. And that's why it's uh, critically important. And I think that the next years we will have um, a better picture in Georgia. Uh, we have uh, quite good economic growth. Uh, next five years, according to the World Bank and the IMF, the economic growth uh, in Georgia will be approximately 5%. And it's, uh, we are leaders in, the, in our region. And also, it's extremely important to have good regulations uh, for the investors because one of the most important thing is to have uh, to increase uh, the foreign direct investments in Georgia. Uh, so that's why uh, I think that I found that that we sh have to share the information and to be in the direct dialogue with the business. I mean, government. And I think that uh, better regulations is the key to reach the economic growth and to increase the foreign direct investments, in, especially in the emerging markets. I think, Vincent, do you have something to add to that? I think you were nodding at some point. <laughs> Indeed, um, echoing what has just been uh, mentioned, I, th I think it's important to, um, again, listen to the corporate world. And according to a survey uh, published in uh, 2019, the uh, Global CEO Survey, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, over-regulation came as number one concern uh, of all business uh, stakeholders. So I believe it tells a lot in terms of margin of man maneuver uh, that we um, that we have. You know, there's a there's a famous uh, essay, I guess, by Leonardo da Vinci that says that uh, um, uh, simplicity uh, or is the key of sophistication. Sometimes we need to less is more, uh, and 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 and. and and small, as we say in Switzerland, is, is beautiful. So it's important that the trust, and this is the economy of trust that you alluded to, be at the center stage of what we achieve from a regulatory uh, perspective. And Mr. Lombardi rightly uh, mentioned auto-regulation, which has been at the DNA of the very consensus forward-driven uh, Swiss methodology of adopting uh, laws and regulation. Of course, uh, this evolved throughout the seven plus hundred years of the creation of our country, which in itself is a bit of a miracle in terms of the mosaic of the communities, linguistic, and that. So, we consensus again uh, was very much anchored in the roots of uh, Switzerland. So that allowed us to have that long-standing history of listening to the business in a trustworthy uh, manner. But again, um, one one clear example was. Um, used actually uh, by uh, a, a, a French minister a couple of years ago. I'm not going to go into any French uh, bashing, especially since in Geneva we had a hundred, count, hundred uh, kilometers of border with our uh, fierce neighbor. But he stood on a he stood on a panel in front of uh, prime time TV in France, and he heralded on the one hand uh, the labor code of uh, France, uh, with, 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 which is about that thick. And potentially there could be a link with the disruptive actions that we're taking, we're witnessing on the social front in France. And on the other hand, uh, in his other, other hand, he had the uh, the Swiss labor law code, which is about that thin. And I believe um, a picture says a lot of words. And this uh, really is a testimonial. Again, each country has its way to operate for very good reasons. Uh, it's not in my uh, perspective to to utter any criticism, but this truly reflect what Switzerland is about. We want smart, sharp, and sound regulation. Of course, there are some dangers, because direct democracy per se is antagonist to predictability and clarity. We change president every year. We can change the constitution every weekend, because we go and cast our votes every, uh, every week. No, I'm exaggerating, but every, every three months. But this is because up front, we have that dialogue 
that we can ensure that once the legislation is adopted, it truly reflects the needs of the business and the concerns of the people, and this is what we need to uh, reconcile. Thank you, Vincent. Um, we've been speaking for about 40 minutes, and we haven't mentioned um, the environment, sustainability, um, a theme that I've picked up on in the last few days. Um, any company that doesn't adhere and is not responsible when it comes to sustainability will cease to exist in a, a couple of years, a few years. Um, maybe, uh, maybe Sasha, you would like to pick up this question. Um, you know, where do you see regulation in terms of ensuring or enforcing that companies are, you know, responsible for protecting and improving the environment? I think sustainability can come in two, uh, in two understandings or two ways to understand. One, is your business sustainable? Can it live tomorrow? Second point: How your business, uh, how your business contributes to the sustainable development of, uh, of humanity. So, from that standpoint, at this day and age, I guess the signal is out there. And of course, uh, our company has a very clear direction and contribution to sustainable development goals uh, on many terms. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is uh, at the same time it is quite important to understand that uh, today it's impossible to live and operate as a major business without know your customer policy, which is self-imposed, without know your supplier policy, without code of conduct, without proper environmental program, because in that case, you will not just be able to operate tomorrow. So partly it's, a, it's, it's your initiative. You have to respond to it proactively. On the other hand, regulation, yes, of course, it can spur uh, some development of the, uh, of, the, of the sustainable policy within the company. Again, you have to give it time because uh, just taking a decision from today to tomorrow would actually ruin uh, the capability of the organization to, to act properly and to react. There's an important debate on plastics. It has been taken in quite a rapid fashion in the, in the European Union and now we're into the implementation phase. What is important in this case is not to fall into the same trap as, for example, was done uh, with, the, uh, with the regulation on so-called track and trace technology which is one of the measures to, innovative measures, uh, to combat illicit trade, which is electronic markets on, 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 on products. It can be watches, it can be cigarettes. In the case of, of, of tobacco, this regulation was adopted in, uh, in a quite forceful manner by the European Union. The implementation time was super short, and at the time of implementation, some of the countries did not even introduce the laws how to implement it yet. So that cost us, on an annual implementation, phase was as a minimum 100 million a year, and then at the ongoing phase is 50 or so million per company. So it's, it's incredible money. So I think the, for such initiatives, you need to give a bit of time to understand what it is. And that's the way, for example, the countries in the Caspian area uh, are treating very wisely, because they provide a pilot, they provide an opportunity to test it, they provide an opportunity to come back to you. So in that sense, sustainability, sustainable development of, uh, of business and contribution to sustainable development uh, goals. It's something which is reasonably innovative, so you have to give uh, time to hatch for this. Lovely, thank you. I'm going to open to questions in just a moment, but just one last question from me for the moment. Uh, Iraqi, maybe you can give us some examples where in Georgia you are addressing the issue of climate change and introducing regulation. Perhaps there's something you're doing that we're not doing in Switzerland, or perhaps you've been able to leapfrog uh, and advance in certain areas that maybe other countries haven't. Uh, and maybe there's some sort of odd regulations that we're not aware of, but could be quite useful. I know in Switzerland, for example, you know, certain products aren't available because they have chemicals in that might then sort of contaminate the water system, for example, um, which is something coming from England I didn't have, so it's quite interesting for me. So, um, I think uh, this, um, quite serious uh, problem also in our country. Um, I can say that we have some uh, innovation uh, decision and solution of these problems. But um, I think that um, uh, we sh you should share the experience than we because um, um, we are uh, so called young democracy yeah uh, we have not so big experience as the young country after we have huge story georgia has huge story but 
as an independent country, we are only 19 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So we are developing, and uh, unfortunately, I can't say that we have any good examples of solving this problem. But anyway, um, it will be very uh, interesting to share the information and um, experience in this sphere. An area that uh, I understand is very upcoming in, in Georgia is um, the service industry, the tourism industry. Maybe you can just give us a word about how you are regulating so uh, can, you know, tourists from abroad benefit and enjoy their experience in Georgia. Um, uh, actually, uh, Georgia is uh, one of the best tourist destinations uh, where we've got lots of tourists and I'll give you the figures and you will be uh, shocked because uh, the whole population of Georgia is 3.7 million and last year we got approximately 8 million tourists in one year. Uh, we have lots of resorts, ski resort as well, Kutauri, one of the best places for ski and we had lots of tourists from Europe, from United States. We have lots of historical places and I, th I think that uh, in tourism we have good experience and lots of countries um, asking f to share this uh, experience with them because uh, in tourism we have really huge success. Uh, one of the most important things I think is um, the stable situation. Uh, as you know, jo Georgia is located in a very tough region, but anyway, uh, due to the last rankings, uh, we can say that uh, Georgia is one of the safe countries in the region, in the whole region, the Europe. Uh, we have sixth position um, in the uh, some security countries. So, uh, and also other historical destinations it uh, helps to increase our tourism and um, I think that uh, this is a huge success. Great, thank you. I was one of the eight million and I was impressed by service. So, uh, Filippo, I think you had something to add to that. Not uh, just to that, but to, to your initial question on sustainability and regulation. Uh, I think we are all aware there are uh, three different levels. Uh, in intervening. I've been also 16 years member of the Energy and Environment Committee of the Swiss Senate, so I had time to learn a bit, a bit about this. But the first level is the preferable level for a liberal like me, but I agree it, it's not always sufficient. And the first level is information, communication, persuasion, convince people to buy more sustainable products, to drive less, to use public transportation, to fly less, to, so I mean, to reduce heating. Huh? Here it's too hot, for instance. A couple of degrees less would be perfect in this room. But uh, uh, okay, this is persuasion, if we want. But it doesn't, it's not always enough. Then you go to a second level, it's incentives, okay? You buy an electric car, you get a subvention. Or you buy a, a, a bad car with a lot of emission, you get, you, you are a penalty. Uh, I mean, you have to pay more taxes for this. So with the incentives. And then comes the third level, the last one, which as a liberal I don't like, but I admit sometimes it's also necessary. And it's a prohibition level, obligation and prohibition. So you are forced to buy this, and it is forbidden to sell something else, for instance, a certain level. Let's take an example on cars. You remember all the discussion 25 years ago, 30 years ago, introducing catalysator in the motors. If it would not have been imposed, it would have taken 20 years before, and nobody would have bought them because they were more expensive than uh, the other cars. And uh, the same is maybe now for electric and hybrid mobility. Maybe some incentive uh, is okay. At a certain moment, you will come to say, this kind of diesel zero, diesel one, will not be allowed anymore at all. So the three levels have always to be uh, uh, used with a certain uh, Fingerspitzengefühl, with uh, some uh, ability to evaluate what is the best level, less invasive but still effective, or sometimes more invasive because the, the other measures were not enough. 
Very good. No, that's a very important point you make. I'm going to ask if there's questions. Yes, sir. Um, do we have a microphone? Coming. Yes. Um, I just want to go back to one point that was touched briefly before by Mr. Subilia, sunset clauses. Um, a lot of regulation tends to outlive its usefulness. And uh, the question is, what can parliaments do uh, in order to have more regulations that is subjected to these sunset clauses? Because if not, the world is getting more complex. More complexity means more regulation. Uh, as a small business, it's a killer. So what can, what can parliaments do, what can big businesses do in order to have more regulation? Uh, I mean, less is more, we, know, we all know that. But what, can, what could be done? I'll, I'll leave it to the national level to Mr. Lombardi, but uh, um, uh, within the, um, the, the, the parliamentary life, at the end of the day, we, um, are the, the people have the very last word. Uh, and again, this is not only rhetorics, this is exactly what happens in reality. Um, I guess in reply to your question, uh, parliamentarians need to be rigorous and disciplined in the way they monitor uh, the relevance uh, of the laws and um, from a Geneva perspective this is something that we do so on a very regular basis we go through the um, uh, the legislative or the regulatory corpus as we call it and we assess the relevance because you rightly mentioned um, again um, the natural tendency and it's quite human is whenever you're outside your comfort zone and in a complex in the VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous environment that we're confronted with, the natural tendency would be to increase the legislative environment because you'd feel more secure. And between, because the state would, would uh, intervene uh, as a état providence, as we stated in French, with uh, a willingness to, or a perception that we would protect you. Um, so again, I think, and certain uh, countries have implemented this, it was alluded to uh, Georgia before, uh, we need to again be in a position to on a regular basis go through uh, the uh, uh, legislation and regulation and take some bold measures uh, by deciding that this has become obsolete and that this not uh, meet uh, requirements. So this is something which is being uh, done, I think, uh, very personally, and this is what my uh, political party is also uh, defending and promoting, we should do it uh, possibly more fiercely. If I may just go back very briefly to sustainability, because this also applies um, in that very key area. I think we all admit here, and this has been heatedly debated uh, here, um, in, uh, in Davos, uh, um, that uh, this is a no-brainer. Uh, tomorrow, companies need to have a sustainable agenda. But let's bear in mind that sustainability is always obeying to a triangle. Of course, there's a climate component to it, which uh, is uh, on top of our priority list, and Greta Thunberg is not in the room, but she would certainly uh, uh, made us uh, fiercely aware of this. But it also goes with the economy that needs to be one of the key drivers and is not, is not a problem but a part of the solution. So we need to listen to business. And also the third angle is the social one. We're almost uh, only male on that uh, panel with your exception, I know. But gender equality, for instance, is also part of all these pressing issues that we need and that business needs to be in a position to reply. And this is where, again, looking at the broad picture, and without adding any layer of regulation, we can build on existing principles. If you look at the SDGs and number 17, whereby you leverage the force of the business for good, I think we can move forward without adding additional regulation, but just by making sure that good sense on existing principle 
uh, prevails. And I think at the end of the day, reason, reason uh, is uh, what should uh, matters. And again, find the right balance between uh, the carrot and the stick. Thank you. My father was not a politician, but he used to say you should accept a new law only when you cancel an old law at the same time. Um, and do you know that in Switzerland uh, we have every year 2,000 pages of new laws and regulations from the, at the federal level, not speak about the cantons and the municipalities, 2,000 pages a year, additional laws and uh, regulations. Uh, we have tried in the parliament to, 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 to stop a bit this, uh, this situation and there have been some colleagues proposing sunset clause that you have to write already when you accept a law until when it is valid and then it would uh, automatically um, fall out if there is not a decision to continue or to, to adapt this law. Unfortunately, these attempts have so far been unsuccessful. But for exactly for the reason I was saying in my initial speech, politicians are there to do something. They need and uh, they have to say to the, to the people, look, we have achieved a new regulation now. Uh, it is a natural tendency. And the administration, even worse, even worse, because uh, the justification of uh, a number of civil servants is that they are there to control that the rules are respected. And uh, so they don't want to, 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 to reduce their own job. They want to increase it. So that's a natural tendency. So the attempts have been there, but so far, no. I was able once uh, in, in my parliamentary life to create a new law. This is the law on Swiss abroad, Swiss people and institutions abroad. And with this new law, we were able to cancel uh, about seven laws and uh, regulations and uh, which were existing uh, before. We have been cancelling these seven and introducing one single law with one ordinance. It was my personal success, but this is an absolute exception. Add to this point? Standpoint of business? Uh, okay, first from the standpoint, I guess, of government. Uh, there's plenty of techniques, guillotine, one in, one out, this has been confirmed as one of the priorities for the Russian government, the newly appointed uh, Russian government, so this should continue, obviously, quite important uh, methodology to reduce the number of legislation. Uh, there's a, uh, the role of business here is quite important because if you small business or large business is affected, there's nobody else for you to do this job. There's a striking, uh, striking statistics. Uh, there was a survey done by a company called FTI, it's one of the partners here in, in Davos. Uh, they discovered, reviewing the G20 uh, countries in business uh, amongst the top business uh, leaders of this country that 44% uh, of business leaders are willing to engage on, on regulatory matters. Good number, but it's striking number because 56 are not willing to engage in regulation. So we can yell and shout and say that we are over-regulated, but unless we take this initiative and come and talk to the government, nobody will do this. So there's, a pl again, plenty with this one-to-ones. There's very strong business associations, like the one we have in Geneva. In that case, there's very strong business association in Kazakhstan, Atamakan, which is having the voice and having the ear of the government. And this example can, uh, can go on. So uh, this also allows small business to participate in, in the discussion. So my points are, this has to be institution institutionalized, this rules of sunsetting or revision of legislation shouldn't lead to more legislation one in, one out, but there's an absolute responsibility of the business in addition to complaining, but to be engaged there. I'll keep it very quick, thank you. Um, the role of artificial intelligence, machine learning, with regulators for designing, developing, simulating regulations, and then during the implementation, so that the self-regulation that you mentioned can be easily imposed. Is there a roadmap for that? Thank you. Well, first, it's, it's again, it's, 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 a, it's a very difficult word, what artificial intelligence is. It was an interesting point made by then Vice President uh, of the European Commission, Timmermans, saying that artificial intelligence is something that we are not regulating yet. And you guys from, from business better come to us because if you don't come and don't talk to us, we'll regulate and this will not be good. So there's a need to, to, to regulate this. 
this part of activity. Second, uh, impact assessments. Again, very important thing how we can communicate back our estimates of what is going to happen to a particular industry or uh, general development of society uh, back to the government. And it's all based on analysis, proper analysis of things. And here's the big question. Does the industry, private business, have a right and opportunity to talk uh, to the government and provide evidence? Is it credible evidence? Again, based on the methodologies that can be developed through artificial intelligence and new approved techniques of calculation, yes, it should be. And definitely, the business, again, must provide this, uh, this, this knowledge to the government because the government does not all. And there may be artificial intelligence or just the use an abacus, but you need to provide your calculations back to the government on the impact of regulation. May very briefly um, on this, I think you, um, you you raised a very interesting question because uh, uh, again, disruptive technologies is not uh, if it's when, and it's also when within the political um, the political uh, space, and there'll certainly be a time whereby, uh, but I don't think we're yet mature for this, whereby we could resort to AI, uh, for instance, in terms of uh, legislative uh, techniques to ensure that precisely uh, we can have that thin line whereby um, we, we adopt only balanced and mindful um, uh, legislation. That said, it's potentially one example whereby regulation would be needed. And you know that uh, um, Geneva is at the center stage of an initiative which is called the New Geneva Convention, which was called upon by Brad Smith, CEO of Microsoft, to ensure that the uh, uh, the corporate world, and here we're talking about auto uh, regulation precisely, could be listened to to foster creatively and with pragmatic, uh, pragmatism uh, rules that would frame uh, the, acti the, the technological uh, uh, activities, in particular with respect to cyber security, where we all we would all admit here that it's a bit of a it's a bit of a jungle. So there, this is one area whereby uh, I guess a set of rules coming from the industry but negotiated with the sovereign governments are needed and I believe that uh, Geneva could play a role in this uh, respect. Coming back very briefly to uh, regulation and it's true and thank you Sasha for mentioning and in partnering uh, uh, proudly with uh, JTI which is a very large player in, uh, in, in Geneva. Thank you for your trust. Um, the mindset should change on top of all types of technologies. And this is what very humbly at the chamber we are advocating. The question should not be, why do not we, why don't we regulate? The question should be, why should we regulate? So I think when we achieve that mindset change, and it's a change of paradigm for the reasons that were mentioned, that civil servants and the politicians, they need to uh, deliver upon the promises. But what, as a politician, a promise to the people could be, I will ensure that we have less regulation, but that the regulation we have will achieve, will meet your requirements and suit your needs on a daily basis. I think that should be uh, our collective goal. Great. We're just coming to the end now. I just want a yes or no answer, Filippo, as an end. <laughs> um, I'm picking on you, sorry. Um, we just touched on it briefly, and it opens up a can of worms, of course. That's why I just keep it simple, yes or no. We lag in Switzerland when it comes to gender equality. Uh, that was mentioned just briefly. Um, will we get to a point, like you mentioned, with the auto industry, um, that we have to enforce a rule, a regulation, where you have to have 50% women and men in a workplace? Will we reach that? Without a regulation, we won't. Uh, but the question is, uh, and now we, we see this, uh, we, we tried to introduce now in the law, for instance, for person um, quotiert, uh, how do you say, uh, companies which are in stock exchange, uh, that they have a minimum of women in the cadre uh, position and so on. So this now, it's a recommendation. And then we have introduced also that for all every big company with more than 100 employees, uh, they must make a check on whether gender equality is secure, at least at, level, at the level of salaries, you, or if there are unjustified these, uh, inequalities due to gender position. They have to produce a report uh, and uh, with the assistance of external auditors every four years. Uh, but this is still starting. Eh? Uh, at the end, if you really want to reach an absolute parity, 
you have to say to impose it by law, which I'm not certain it is a good thing. Um, and Iraqi, maybe just to close, um, how are you doing in that um, area in Georgia? Do you feel that you were having gender equality across um, the board? Um, I can say that uh, in last elections, I uh, showed, in, I mean, the parliament elections, um, this is exact that there are more women in the politics. Uh, we have more women in parliament of Georgia. And I think that um, there was some idea to regulate this thing, that um, to have more women in um, politics. But I think that in Georgia we doesn't have any such kind of problems. So um, I think it will be so without any regulations. It can naturally increase the women role in politics, and of course it's very nice. Well, um, we this happened in Switzerland uh, last uh, October, November. We have now the parliament in the Swiss history is the highest women's uh, percentage without having imposed by law. And I almost freely gave up my place for a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can say that also in Georgia. <laughs> uh, actually, I can say that in Georgia, uh, when our country was for three years independent in 1918, we got the first woman in the member, she was a member of Parliament of Georgia. And this is very important. And also we got the woman king in the um, in our history. Uh, so it means that in Georgia we doesn't have any such kind of problems. Thank you. And if I may very briefly, but maybe for our foreign guests, they won't be aware of it, but Switzerland has a female president. This is something worth noting among the seven ministers that rotate on a yearly uh, basis. And it's uh, currently a female president. And the first citizen of the country heading the, uh, um, heading the, the parliament is also uh, a, a lady. So I think in terms of gender equality, there's certainly a margin of maneuver, but uh, we are heading in the right direction. And also in Georgia, we have got vice prime minister is women, and also the president of Georgia is women. <laughs> is Salam is the bishop. battle of females. <laughs> battle. <laughs> yes, it's coming, maybe. Um, yeah. um, thank you very much. We are having a coffee break now, so if you would like to approach and ask questions.